Hi, and welcome back to Codex. Uh, next up, we have another talk that was rescheduled from the 2022 JMM special session on recent advances in packing. Our speaker is Gary Greaves. Dr. Greaves is a senior lecturer in the Division of Mathematical Sciences in the School of Physical and Mathematical Sciences at Nanyang Technological University. Dr. Greaves' research is in algebraic graph theory, combinatorial design, and computational discrete mathematics. Today, he will tell us about Hermitian matrices of roots of unity and their characteristic polynomials. Please take it away, Gary. Thanks a lot for the introduction, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me to talk here. So I want to talk about characteristic polynomials of Hermitian matrices whose entries are all roots of unity. Before I mention the results, I'll start by giving some motivation for these uh, results that I'll present. So I'll start off with equiangular lines. Equiangular lines are those lines spanned by unit vectors with complex entries, such that the absolute value of the inner product of any two distinct spanning vectors is constant. Um, so some standard examples are the um, antipodal lines of, of a regular hexagon, these three lines here. And in three dimensions, you can also take antipodal lines, uh, this time of a regular icosahedron. So this time you get six lines in dimension three, and these are real equiangular lines. All of the spanning vectors have real entries. And I want to give one more example and that I've chosen to be Hogger's lines. So Hogger's lines have a nice structure where you start off with these two Pauli matrices, X and Z, and then you have this matrix D where you tensor together products of X and Z, giving you an eight by eight matrix. So you have all this bunch of matrices D parameterized by these Ki, and you also have a vector uh, with eight entries. And the vector is quite uh, interesting because it just has two distinct entries, this one and the rest ones all divided by this guy here. And to get your spanning lines, you just multiply this vector by all of these matrices D parameterized by the Ki, where the Ki are all zero and one, all different possibilities of zero and one. And so that gives you 64 vectors, and they have this very special property that the inner product between any distinct pair is equal to plus or minus a third. Uh, so this time we have a, a complex construction contrasting with the real construction we just saw. And so I'm introducing this stuff because I want to somehow get to Hermitian matrices. And I'm interested in Hermitian matrices whose entries are all roots of unity. So instead of just considering all possible equiangular lines systems, I want to focus on those whose inner products are all just differ by some multiple of a root of unity. And this is not a strange thing to do because a lot of the constructions have this form. So symbolically, if we just divide uh, the inner product by alpha, we just get a bunch of roots of unity. And so examples of these are all real equiangular lines. There your root of unity can be taken to be minus one. Hogger's lines was another example where you have square root of minus one is your root of unity. And there's also been many, many other constructions. Uh, so I just mentioned a couple of infinite constructions uh, coming from Steiner systems and different sets. And this is due to many, many different authors. So just to mention a few, uh, we have um, Matt Fickers, who's the next speaker, I believe, uh, John Jasper, who's one of the organizers, and also Dustin Mixon, just to name a few. And of course, there are many more that I'm not even mentioning. So all of these have this property where the inner products are just differing by some root of unity. Okay, so this is what I'm going to be interested in. So now how do we get from that to our Hermitian matrices? Well, that's this um, 
that's this process here. So you start off with your equiangular lines. And just to avoid trivialities, we assume our angle is positive. We take unit spanning vectors of our lines. And we're looking at the case where the inner product is just alpha multiplied by some root of unity. Then we can take the gram matrix, which will be populated by ones on the diagonal because our spanning vectors should be unit vectors. And on the off diagonal, it's just this um, inner product. So we have alpha multiplied by some roots of unity. And then to turn it into something nice, we just minus off the diagonal, divide by alpha. And now we have this nice uh, Hermitian matrix, uh, all of whose entries except the diagonal uh, are roots of unity. And so you, this is a reversible process. And so this brings me on to an object that I'm calling a Q Zidal matrix. And so Q is just the order of a primitive root of unity uh, so that this thing is true. So my zeta here is always going to be some primitive Q root of unity. And so um, if you know about real equiangular line systems, you'll know that uh, this Q Zidal matrix uh, is po possibly a reasonable uh, name for it. Although if you come from a different direction, then you might want to call it something else, but I'm going with a Q Zidal matrix here. Okay, so that's the object and that's something that's related to. So just to put this into context, I'm going to move towards an even more special type of equiangular line system. And that's an equiangular type frame. So we can think of these simply as um, equiangular line system whose Q Zidal matrix just has two distinct eigenvalues. So here I have the characteristic polynomial. This is a notation I'm going to use throughout. This chi of S X can be factorized like this. So we just have two distinct eigenvalues and, and we such a, a Q Zidal matrix corresponds to something called a DN ETF, equiangular type frame. And a very important central question is about the existence of these objects ETFs. So uh, the question might be, for which pairs D and N does there exist a DN ETF? Uh, so just to remind you, I'm not working in full generality here. I'm restricting to this case where uh, we have a Q Zidal matrix corresponding to the ETF. Uh, so instead of, instead of looking at this central question, which is apparently quite difficult, I'm going to try to make things easier for myself by restricting to this uh, modified question, where given a D and N, I want to know for which Q does there exist a Q Zidal matrix that corresponds to a D, N, ETF. Okay. Uh, now to motivate this modified question even further, uh, we can point to real ETFs, and this is when Q equals two. So our root of unity, our primitive root of unity is just minus one. And the real case is considered um, to be some area where there's not much room for maneuvering since it just corresponds to something called a strongly regular graph. Uh, it's still an interesting question to try to figure out when these things exist, but since um, this has been heavily worked on, uh, we try to uh, avoid just sticking to this case. Um, so an example I wanted to focus on just to get us, just to give us something to keep in our minds is the case when D is 19, N is 76, or D is 20, N is 96. And I think this is quite an interesting place to start. So in this case, uh, if you ask, does there exist a 1976 ETF? If your Q is two, that's the real case. We know that it doesn't exist. This was a, a heavy computational proof. And these two things just happen to be quite similar. And so a similar uh, investigation resulted in the same non-existence result for um, the 2096 ETF when Q is two. However, if you relax a bit and let Q equal four, uh, it, it turns out that 
you can construct a 2096 ETF. And um, this was done by Fickus, Mixon, and Tremaine in 2010. They found a construction uh, for this one. Um, but um, for some reason, they couldn't find a similar construction for this 1976 ETF. Uh, and then a bit later on, pushing these methods a bit further, they managed to find constructions for both of these. So this one again, 2096 and 1976, when Q is six. And so um, part of my modified question would be, does this one exist? What, so can we get a 1976 ETF when Q is four? Uh, so already this is not known. And um, that's an, a nice starting motivation for what I want to talk about. And I should also mention some similar research performed by Bernhard Bodman and um, I forgot the first name, Elwood, considering ETFs when the when Q is prime. So they managed to find some uh, restrictions, but uh, restricted to just Q is prime. So that's a that's um, some restriction to keep in mind. And I want to differentiate what I'm doing from what they were doing um, by telling you uh, what they weren't doing, which is looking at principal submatrices. So this slide is illustrating where I want to go with this, um, what the big picture is for this work. So again, this is our modified question. Um, given D and N for which Q does there exist a Q Zydo matrix corresponding to an ETF, corresponding to that ETF. And my aim is to get some non-existent results. So show that certain Q cannot produce a Q Zydo matrix since, um, since I have some techniques in the real case that uh, lead to similar things. So the idea is to consider the principal sub matrices of a putative Q Zydal matrix S um, corresponding to an ETF. So in other words, S just has two distinct eigenvalues. So why is this a reasonable thing to try? Well, first of all, any principal submatrix of a Q Zydal matrix is also a Q Zydal matrix. And there are some interlacing conditions. So using Cauchy's interlacing theorem, we know that the characteristic polynomial of any principal submatrix will interlace those of the original characteristic polynomial of S. And the extra, the extra bit of power um, I try to establish is that the characteristic polynomial of a principal submatrix um, has coefficients that belong to certain ideals of this ring of integers. And so this is what I'm going to talk about today, this last point here. Uh, other stuff is still work in progress. And, the, and just, to, just to advertise this strategy a bit more, uh, this strategy has managed to work in some cases for two Zydo matrices. However, it, oh yeah, so I'll, I'll just stop there. So it has, it has uh, managed to produce some non-existent result when Q is two. Okay. So now I can start to talk about these conditions on the coefficients of characteristic polynomial. So this slide's a bit of history. So this kind of investigation for two Zydo matrices goes back to 2012, when we know that Harmers, who was actually a PhD student of Zydo himself, he knew about the determinants of a Zydo matrix is always the same uh, mod two, as long as you fix the order. So any n by n two Zydo matrix has determinant congruent to n minus one modulo two. That's kind of starting result. And in 2016, with um, these co-authors, we push this a bit further to modulo eight. Uh, so we can say determinant of a Zydo matrix, a two Zydo matrix is congruent to one minus n mod eight. And here I'm restricting to n even. Importantly, uh, n is even on this slide. And then in 2019, we push this even further. So we were thinking 
Why do we only care about the determinant? What about the other coefficients? And we managed to find they're super restricted. So actually the whole characteristic polynomial is determined modulo eight uh, when n is even. And if you go modulo higher powers of two, there are not many possibilities. So there's two modulo 16 uh, and you have this general upper bound here. And if you go to n odd, the, the results are similar. So here I'm just changing n to odd and the blue is where it changes. So this, instead of being mod eight for even, uh, this becomes mod four. And these also get slightly weaker. So just note that n odd is slightly, slightly more slippery thing to deal with. Um, so I think I'll just quickly say some consequences. Oh, I see I'm running quite slow on time, so I better speed up. Uh, so, so some quick spectral consequence of this. Uh, we know modulo two that the characteristic polynomial of a Zydel matrix is equal to this one if n is even, or this one if n is odd. And immediately you get a whole bunch of interesting consequences. These are consequences, some of which have been pointed out uh, using other techniques. But first of all, um, and if we have an even integer eigenvalue, the multiplicity is at most one. So that would be corresponding to this factor here. Uh, there can't be any even integer eigenvalues of n is even. And square root two can't be an eigenvalue of any uh, two Zydel matrix. Okay, so I'll skip over the details of how to prove this. So there's a bit of information about how to prove this. Quickly just mention that for the odd case, which is considered a difficult case, um, in, order to, in order to get the extra meat we needed to prove it, we had to use this quite beautiful uh, classical result of Harari and Schwenk, which gives us a congruence for, um, for matrices. So this is a congruence involving uh, a graph adjacency matrix A, and the proof is a nice application of Burnside's lemma. So you let the dihedral group act on closed walks and uh, you can count orbits and you'll get something like this. Very, very nice. And so in the, in the complex case, since I see I'm running low on time, I'll just quickly jump to uh, the main result. So the main result is about how many congruence classes are there of characteristic polynomials modulo this thing here made up of one minus zeta and multiplied by one minus zeta inverse. And we can get analogous bounds. Uh, so the interesting thing to point out here is we get these nice bounds when P is a prime power. Uh, so if we think back to the earlier slide where Q is six seems to be more flexible when producing ETFs, that's because, uh, well, my argument here is when we have a non-prime power, for example, six, we don't get any of these strong restrictions. Okay, and the last slide, sorry for the rush, but the last slide um, is a crucial ingredient we needed to get the complex analog of our bounds to work. And this is, I, th I was quite delighted with this uh, generalization. So this again is the Harari Schwenk classical congruence for graph adjacency matrices, which one can obtain from two Zydel matrices like this. So we have this congruence here. And the analogous thing, if you go to a power of two Zydel matrix, you do a kind of analogous move to get an adjacency matrix. So this is actually not an adjacency matrix. It has some complex entries. It's not even Hermitian, a bit of a strange uh, object, this, this one here, but you can see it's analogous to this. So it's just the same kind of form divided by one minus zeta. Here, zeta would be minus one. And then you get uh, this expression here. So what you have is some sure products hiding, hiding around when you have a graph JC matrix. So this A to the D turns into A Hadamard power N divided by D. And this a to the power n over two turns into a Hadamard product, a transpose. So it was a quite a 
um, what I consider a nice generalization of this classical result. Uh, so I, sorry that I uh, didn't manage my time very well, but that's all I, I wanted to say. So thanks a lot for listening and uh, please ask questions if there are any. Well, first let's all react to uh, Carrie's awesome talk and hitting that reaction button. And then uh, we're gonna hit stop on the recording.